right, hopefully this lets me still share my screen. Let's see. All right, Just so, FYI, I, 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 I yes. might need to drop in the middle because of a conflicting meeting, I hope. That's okay. Okay, sure. sure. Don't worry. Uh, so again, this is going to be a super fast recap on just the general concepts that are needed to try to uh, get a general understanding of the, the goals here to jump into straight to a, a live demo. So uh, one of the concepts to review is uh, the motivation here. Um, there's a lot of um, blossoming of Unix and Linux these days. And one of the things that uh, I really like about it, it uh, Unix and Linux has been pipes and it essentially lets the best tool win. However, one of the things that we've been lacking is uh, a nice way to do something similar with host and device spring up in a very agnostic cloud way or virtualization way. There's not many open source tools available for that and not much expertise. Uh, for kernel development, we also need kernel CI. There's a lot of complex solutions out there and nothing uh, that's really cloud agnostic. So I wasn't really satisfied with these solutions out there. So I tried to try to bring all the Swiss Army knives together. Um, and one of the things that really made a difference was integrating kconfig because that's essentially what it does. It allows variability. As it stands today, the current tools that are embraced are Vagrant and Terraform for uh, providing virtualization cloud and agnostic solutions, also bare metal support. Um, cloud init is something that's being evaluated at this point in time, given that there are always issues with Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant is based on Ruby. It's old distribution integration is always a pain. Um, and Cloud Init seems to be a way to, to move forward with that. Most of the advancements that you will see within KDOPS, you will see that they incorporate Kimu custom customizations. And to try to do that and to integrate it with uh, uh, VirtualBox together with Kimu seems a bit hard. So. Um, let the best tool win, really, right? So uh, cloud in it might be the way to go. Um, the other thing too is that it, it is a, a development and testing automation framework for kernel developers. And as such, we rely heavily in tools that kernel developers typically are used to. Make files are things that we're used to. So we use make file targets as well for KDevOps to try to simplify the complexities of other alternative tools. Um, Ansible is another tool that is heavily used. And this is one of the ways to uh, essentially try to uh, fixate how it is that you work with specific target workflows. Um, and it allows you to s simplify, you know, shell scripting and make easy changes uh, to be reviewed. Um, so determinism. So it, it's important to review this because um, we, we don't get an appreciation for the difficulty in testing otherwise. Um, and for Linux kernel development, there's tons of different tools out there for testing the kernel. KUnit is extremely deterministic, to give you an example. You know, you, you run the tests and they're all supposed to pass, unless you the test already knows that it's supposed to fail. Um, Self-tests tend to have higher determinism, you know, but typically they, they, they should all pass, right? Um, however, FS doesn't block tests, obviously can fail randomly. And um, the issue though, is that any failure can be pretty uh, catastrophic. Uh, to give you an example, one of the issues <coughs> that have been reproduced with KDOPS was an odd x86 IRQ bug that was only possible to reproduce after you try to test 10,000 reboots in a row. It was thought to believe uh, to have been a testing bug a long time ago, but it's actually reproducible within KDOPS. Um, and you need to do that. Why? Because essentially, otherwise, you can't have a baseline. Um, so it, it, it is really important to try to keep this in mind when you're trying to look into kernel CI efforts or testing, because it really gives you a, a, a mindset for how to prepare for how to properly resource this sort of effort. Uh, all these different components need to be independently evaluated and analyzed for uh, the effort required. Otherwise, you just have kernel developers doing all the work. And that's typically what we do today. And this is why we have some gaps in the community because we tend to do this and we're actually not so great at some of these things. Um, so KDevOps also embraces this thing of kernel CI to try to deal with these um, baselines. 
and also try to deal with the non-deterministic tests. We strive to try to get baselines that are pretty solid for things that are also non-deterministic, like Avestas and block tests. So we brought forward the concept of trying to repeat running a fast test over and over and over and over again. And this came from the idea of testing on Enterprise Linux, specifically in SUSE Linux, uh, where we basically were using uh, KDOPS to basically test FOSS systems. Um, and this has also now pick, picked up onto stable testing with uh, XFS. So the latest efforts to test with XFS, you'll see that some folks have been using KDOPS. Uh, on the cloud environment. Some other folks have been using this also for testing with local virtualization. Um, so um, baselines, just to, to give you an idea, the effort required to try to create a new baseline is quite substantial, but we've reduced the amount of time it takes. Um, it takes about one to two months to get a solid baseline, just to give you an idea. Um, all right, so now let's just jump into the demo. Um, and all right, let's see. Can you guys see this? Yes. Anyone? Yes. All right, so for example, I just push some changes just now over like 10 minutes ago uh, for um, some changes that I have here. This is why my tree is dirty, but you, you guys can, can see this if you guys want to try this as well. Uh, so you run make many config to try to get into directly to the variability that you get typically with Linux kernel development. Um, I'm running on, on, a, on a big server, but it doesn't really matter because the first one that I'm going to try to demo is actually uh, running on the cloud. So if you look, you can select the architecture here. Uh, the latest one that I just added a few minutes ago was ARM64. Um, and you can look at Terraform solution. That's default right now because ARM64 only supports Terraform at this point in time. Then you get to select the cloud environment that you want. For ARM64, we only support OpenStack and the AWS. Um, Oregon is the region right now. And we're going to test this new um, instance. It's a, it's a relatively new instance. It's an ARM64 instance. Uh, and I'm just going to change here the, the name. Let's go with ARM3 and run mate. Now, what this is going to do is just essentially try to ramp up an instance that typically we can use for general kernel development. The make parameter here is just writing all these uh, variables that we typically have obtained through kconfig. So .config, it outputs an extra YAML file this is one of the files that it looks at. So essentially we're converting config to YAML and all these things might look kind of familiar if you're, you're doing kernel development a lot, like the TTY stuff, uh, systemd watchdog. This gives you an idea of some of the defaults that we have. You have the Python interpreter. If you want to support the old ones you do, gives you an idea of where you're looking for playbooks, you know, um, and then you have uh, KDOP's generic, generic directory for, for data. So we're going to create a general data partition. We're using ButterFS for it, typically. Um, uh, you can actually configure anything here, right? Your SSH configuration, whether or not you want to update your SSH. The, this is the Terraform data, for instance. Um, and now I'm just going to do make bring up. Now what this is actually doing is getting all the information that I actually just uh, configured through make many config. And now it's actually using Terraform to try to bring this guest up. Now, again, again, this is the, the second time. I, I know that this works just because I, I just committed this a little while ago. And the reason I committed is obviously because I knew that this would work. But I just implemented this. And I hadn't touched Terraform code in I don't know how long. So, um, the, do other cloud solutions work? Yes. Um, Ch Chandan Babu um, had added support for OCI recently. Um, Google Cloud Compute is also available. Um, so you can either SSH to this guy or you can SSH this way. You know, this is the manual way.
So this is an architecture, um, ARM64 architecture. Um, and one of the things that folks might be interested in who was looking into working, let's say, on large block type of stuff is that, yes, this is a large block type of system. Um, So let's see what this looks like. Um, so it is an uh, AWS NVMe interface. Uh, so now if I just want to destroy it, just to make destroy. Now, um, this basically just completely gets rid of the instance. If you're working with cloud solutions, you probably have gotten already before the um, warning, right? To not leave instances running. This is what you definitely should do if you're working with cloud solutions. Otherwise, you're going to be paying at, you know, out, of, out of pocket for, for instances that are just left running for a long time. How much do these cost? Well, it depends, right? The most expensive one that I've seen is about 10 bucks an hour. The cheapest one is less than 10 cents an hour. This one, I think, is about 10 cents an hour, for instance. Um, all right, well, let's move on now. Let's leave this destroying. And uh, let's close this. And now, can you guys see this as I'm typing here? Someone? Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, let's actually do something new. So what, what, do you, what do you typically do for a setup? Well, um, I recommend having partitions dedicated on a system, you're gonna use a local virtualization uh, for different file systems based on your confidence of that kernel for that host uh, file system um, for stability, right? If you're working with bleeding edge, I'm not sure if you, I'd recommend that for the host. You want something pretty solid on the host side, but you don't also want something that's actually too, too, uh, too new because Sorry, sorry. You don't want something too too stable, too old that it doesn't have the latest Ansible, for instance. And for this reason, I tend to recommend uh, rolling distributions like Tumbleweed, Debian testing, um, Fedora. You know, uh, the latest Fedora, for instance. So uh, Kidop supports the latest uh, distributions, and it is distribution agnostic. It does support at least Tumbleweed, Fedora, Debian. That seems to also mean that it, it supports uh, Ubuntu and you know other Red Hat based uh, distributions. I haven't tested them myself, but it seems people are using them. Um, so what I tend to do is I also create libvirt pools on each of these partitions. Um, so I just need to make sure that I have enough uh, space available. The pools I actually allocate in these libvirt directories, for instance, and KDOPS is smart enough that to know it, whether or not you already created a pool. So let's say demo, Let's call it March. So I'm just going to get clone this tree. And let's do something a bit more sensible. Now the defaults change. The default architecture is going to be x86-64. Um, and because you know, this is the default, if you select another architecture, you reduce the options. Um, so I'm not going to change anything other than just go straight into um, um, the bring up methods here. The default is to use uh, KVM or virtual blocks. By default, we use libvirt, eight vCPUs, four gigs of RAM, Q35 system, use you know, uh, you know, CPU pass through. Otherwise, you can't do things like perf and, and, and other sorts of things that require your CPU on your host, for instance. Uh, it automatically picked up my liver pool here. Uh, it actually picked up the name as well, so I don't have to actually do anything. If you already have a liver pool on your path where you're configuring, it'll do that as well. Um, Fedora is different, that it embraces a, a, a Kimu session uh, rather than system um, that basically strives to uh, provide a bit more security, but you know other distributions haven't picked up. 
you can look at the key config options to 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 go and venture out whether or not you want to rant about what you know who did what and so forth. Here you can check the distribution. Here are the distributions that are supported. We also have specific uh, KDevops images as well that are available as demo at this point in time. My goal was to try to see if we can actually collaborate with the Debian folks to try to get Debian instances with actual actual kernels deployed for them, so that way we don't actually have to build them like uh, based on. Linux is tree, Linux next, and so forth. It should be relatively easy, but that just needs to be done. Um, I really haven't changed anything here, as you can see. I'm just going over some of their parameters, but let's go enable the Kimio drives for large IO experimentation. Um, I really don't wanna change anything else. So let's go to target workflows. This will allow me, allow me to try to change the kernel that I run. If you, ch you select a large IO workflow, by default, it'll, it'll um, try to compile a Linux kernel, and it'll try to use 9p as default as well. This is uh, so that way the host can actually compile a kernel for you, and then you can actually use the guest to just mount the, um, the file system using 9p. It'll use my my tree for this specific uh, large I/O testing. That's because I have some tree uh, changes here from the kernel that are specific to large I/O development that are not upstream even on Linux Next. <clears throat> my tree is based on Linux Next, and I just have Delta, like a few set of patches, some of them, which will enable you to experiment with large block devices for NVMe. Um, and some patches that are important also, like Matthew Wilcox's uh, changes for EXT4 for folios, for instance. Um, shallow clone, this will just make sure that this is just a fast clone. So let's just do that since it's much, much easier and faster. And let's just change this to, let's say, March. This is important. That hostname prefix is going to be used for modifying the workflows that you have. If you have workflows like FS test, then it'll add a postfix for the file system and then the section that you're testing. If you're testing block test, it's going to add a postfix with the name of the block target, like NVMe, for instance, uh, or uh, loop, for instance, or NVD, or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, well, you know, let's. Take a, a look at some of the other workflows too. Uh, I didn't get, get into that. Uh, so here are the workflows that are currently supported. You can essentially do, these are also respective make targets. So once I do the bring up of the host, I can basically do make FS test, make block test, make CXL, make you know, whatever, self-test and so forth. Adding one, you can just basically get loud for these. Um, let, let's enable FS test. Um, and let's see. Let's enable testing. Yeah, sure, ButterFS, why not? Um, and let's configure how we run a test for, for Butterfest, all these are the profiles that are tested. That's a lot of profiles. We don't want to do all this stuff. Let's skip the compression stuff. Um, so no compression. Let's do the, limit it to that, how about that? So we only have three, just to bring up three guests. Okay, so again, the name is March prefix and I'm running make. <clears throat> this will basically do this exact same thing, just that now it's uh, uh, checking that everything that I actually inputted before uh, throwing it to Ansible playbooks will actually make sense. Make will, the first thing it'll do is generate the extra bars file. It'll propagate that to all specific playbooks that we support for make targets. If you run a, a specific make target, you're essentially just running Ansible. Um, and you're passing in the extra bars file. These are doing sanity checks to make sure that you, these things make sense. Let's look at what this looks like now. So it gives you the, the path, data device, I'm using ButterFS, um, the target for Linux, so it's actually using Linux Next. It's using this branch, which will be based on Linux Next for that date. So Linux Next of this date, because of the, the last few Linux and X actually have issues with 9P. I actually reported those issues already to the community. Uh, so it seems that the issue has been identified. 
uh, and that's going to be fixed eventually. But until now, this is the latest Linux X that we can use with not proper 9P support. These are the tags for that we passed for 9P. Um, <clears throat> we have enabled workflows. This is the workflow specific variables that we're going to pass for Ansible for uh, FS tests. Um, these are specific to FS tests, so we use sparse files. So this is to try to reduce the amount of space that you're using when you're actually running uh, FS tests. So it basically just uses loopback files. Um, and then these are specific to generic, you know, variables for playbooks for, for, for KidOps. Then you have the libvirt stuff here. And these are generic to uh, uh, the break, the, the single playbook that's always run is dev config. That'll do things like just app get update, bin, emacs, typical stuff that we were used to, you know, uh, or, you know, yum install, whatever. And it'll also set up things that we're used to as kernel developers, like your TTY and, uh, and so forth that we always want to have set up. So let's see what this looks like. Well, first thing I should review is make help. Make help will always be dynamic in the sense that depending on what you enabled, you'll only see those targets. So if you didn't enable the Linux workflows, like you know compiling Linux, you won't see them. If you didn't enable the workflow for uh, running a fast test, you won't see those targets. So a fast test is one of the targets. It tells you what it does. I hope it's pretty clear. Uh, this is the one that we'll use if we want to actually start testing the baseline. Um, then we have, let's see, Joseph added this for just generically compiling ButterFS progs. I think this should, this should probably go into, uh, fold it into some other option, but anyway. Um, so no, let's just do make bring up. Um, so now it's going to read those, the extra bars, YAML file, it'll pass it to the playbook that's specific to Chemio for bring up. Um, one of the issues that typically um, is, is, is hard is to set the environment for your, your system to use local, enable local virtualization for the, the regular user that you're logging into as, the, as a user. So as such, um, KDOPS has an option um, where you essentially uh, can specify that it's your first time running. So let me see here, I'm on my local system. Can you guys see what I'm typing here? Can you guys, anyone? Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Okay. If you run make many config, uh, one of the options here, is this your first time running KDOPS? This option right here, first run, just enable that and then run make. What that'll do is it'll actually go through your system to make sure that you have your user as part of the groups that are required for running KVM, uh, sorry, Libvirt, uh, VersH, for instance, um, and that you can use KVM guests. Um, it's a pain in the ass, it really is, and I wish that this was easier. So maybe in the future, this can be made easier. It'll eventually complain that you have App Armor enabled, SE Linux enabled, and then you have to go disable it in your kernel boot config, reboot, and it, you basically keep running make over and over and over until it stops complaining. Once it stops complaining, then you're good. Do basic, just generic, you know, make many config. Don't, don't change anything other than just, actually just the default, just use the regular defaults and make sure that you can bring up a guest with make bring up. Just make many config, exit, make, make bring up. Run that, once you have that working, then you can, you know that you can run local virtualization um, targets using uh, KDOPS, then, then you basically want to disable the, the first run option. The first run option is just going to do the sanity checks and it takes a long time to build all the sanity checks and as such, it's not enabled by default. So it's pain in the ass, but it's just what we have right now. If other folks have ideas about how to work around that, then great. Let's see how this is going. So these are the hosts that are brought up. Uh, it actually only brought up these ghosts. Thought it would do the other ones. I don't know why I didn't do the other ones. I think I didn't specify enabling a few of the options. Anyway, um, so I can SSH to this guy. So just as with with cloud solutions, you can SSH directly to the guests that are uh, made available. 
but you're not going to be SSHing on. You're just going to be running targets from the host. Um, I don't know why only one of the guests came up. Um, I have to review why that actually happened. Probably I just disabled too, too many options, I don't know. But typically that would have actually created at least three of the guests. Um, and this would be running in parallel for each of the three guests. And the reason that we're running this in parallel is that one of the ways to divide and conquer and speed up running a fast test for a file system is by defining all the MKFS parameters into sections and then running in parallel a fast test against all those guests. Um, and that reduces the amount of time for testing the file system. Um, obviously, it really depends on what your distribution is and what you want to focus on. Uh, you can review the MKFS parameters. If you want to, you know, test other uh, network file systems, so forth, similar concepts apply here. Um, so what this is doing is creating your data partition. It's it's an NVMe drive. You can see the, the dev disk by ID. This is um, implemented by Joseph to try and ensure that we have the correct partition regardless of the reboots that we have available. Um, the data partition is kind of like just where we throw random data that we want to keep around. Uh, we used to throw in the Linux kernel there on the guest, but obviously that's a, a pain and, and it's really slow to try to compile the kernel on, on the on the guest. So as such, uh, 9P was embraced to try to now compile uh, Linux on the host and using 9P on the guest. So um, the next step that I'll do here is run make Linux, for instance, that'll actually try to get git clone Linux um, and uh, install it on the on the target. Um, let's see here. Um, this will take a while, so let's move on to another thing while that runs. Let's look at it at a setup where we already have something established. Um, here is a example of a system where I already have uh, all these um, guests already brought up, so we don't have to wait for them. Um, I can do SSH and then you name. So that's running Linux next, right? Um, and all I had to do, for example, let's say I, I was in the other window and, and instead of ButterFS, I did XFS and I configured the disk. This is exactly what would have happened. If, if I ran make Linux, you end up with Linux next for that version on all those different guests. Uh, so now, um, I, I know that this already has M MK FS test installed. So I already had run this target right here. So I know that I can run FS test. In fact, I know that a test is ongoing right now. So if I want to check to see what the status of those tests are, I can run the script right here. And what this is going to do is actually SSH into them. Look at the varlib um, XFS test directory. Uh, and check for the status and also do its own heuristics to try to see how long it actually took to run something, how long a test is actually running for. So this tells us right here that we've been running for 2,225 2, seconds. Uh, went 2,225 uh, and it's stalled, right? So if you're running kernel CI targets, those have the heuristic to pick up this thing and say, this host is hosed you likely have, have to reboot it because it, it's probably failing. Uh, is Derek on the line? No. Is anyone familiar with these issues on the line? Ghosts. Okay. So these are issues. These are probably real issues. We can SSH to them. We can, you know, look at them. Well, let's see how we would debug this. Sudo um, verse H list and then grep for XFS. That'll give you the actual name that's used by Libbert. So we know that this one's called demo. Let's look for the demo. So now let's look for this guy. So sudo verse h console, that gives us the console. I can log in there or I could just SSH to them. But let's leave this one running here and then let's SSH, SSH directly to the guest as well. Let's see what happens if we just do a re. Actually, let's try to do it. See what's running. Check is not running. So something's odd. 
Let's just reboot the guest. Hey. Someone has a comment? No. So I'm just forcing the reboot here. As you see, you know, when you have, um, you know, the, the playbooks already ran, then you can basically just ch check the kernel that you want. You can boot into the first kernel, the distro kernel, or the default kernel. Um, Another thing you could do is get, let's say, uh, so this is again, checking the status. I'm just gonna reset the ones that, that actually thinks that, that are hosed. And then I'm going to run a, a specific target that tries to collect the, the um, so now it just thinks two of them are hosed. So this one's still. St Oops. Thirty-two, thirty-four. Actually, I didn't need to reset that other one. Uh, but you know, I could basically. I'm sure that that's going to come up in a minute. So let's review some of the the, the options here. Um, FS test results, baseline results. This is a target that I'm going to run, and what this is going to do is going to check. Um, the var lib XFS test results directory and collect all the data for all the tests that are run. I can inspect that to try to get an idea of to see what issues likely happened. Um, so this guest already came up, so I can probably assume the other ones are already set up. Um, and this will actually gather that on the local host. Eventually, once you run a baseline, it'll also um, archive. Uh, the files for you, and you can actually contribute them to to KDOPS too. It is community based effort, meaning that these baselines are completely community driven. Um, and if you want to share them, you can do that. I encourage that just because it helps. You can, for instance, just get grub on on KDOPS for a specific test like XFS slash zero forty or whatever was failing to see if I see other Linux distributions or other kernels who had issues. I can try to see Git log or did blame to see who added it, to see if they added a gist or a bug reference or whatever. Um, and um, so as you can see, it's trying to look for DMS files for only, it, it does generate the DMS files, but it'll only copy over the DMS files for actual actually failed tests. Um, so the same exact concept applies to block tests. Now the design for how do you actually generate these tests and so forth is very specific to the target test that you're running. For self-tests, it's a bit different, right? Because we don't have all these bar lib whatever, you have another type of output and you also, you expect things to, to work. One of the issues that I recently addressed to um, Shua was that right now, if you actually wanna run a generic set of self-tests, it relies on specific target timeout and you can't reconfigure that. And she, uh, she wasn't really uh, too, in, um, uh, I guess, uh, supported by the idea that you can have a different specific timeout for, for each specific workflow. Uh, so as such, my recommendation was to maybe have an environment variable. We'll see if we can get to that point. With that in place, then we can automate this process running a specific uh, uh, target uh, self-test using something like KDOPS. So that way my, my goal would be to eventually run KDOPS, you know, uh, for self-test for all the subsystems that I maintain. So that gather all, the, all that data, you can see here the those files there, but you can also do get status to see what the results look like. And what we have here, is a simple text file of the failures. And as such, if we had that baseline already established, I would just run git diff and it would actually show the delta. There's no diff here because there's no delta, but it would show one line diff 
for a regression. So if a regression is found, if you enable the option to email you as a report, it's just a diff and you'll see, oh, this is a new issue. So that's test specific and you can also configure your own test to do something similar. But we've done that for Festus, we've done that for block tests. For the other tests, they're not none undeterministic as FSS and block tests. So as such, you expect them to pass. Depends on your workflow, you may have different requirements. So at this point in time, I'd like to open up uh, for four questions. And if not, then I'd also like to pass on uh, to Jeff to, uh, to, to uh, talk about NFS. I hear no questions yet, so Jeff. Pass on the baton to you. Sounds good. Um, hang on a second. Let me uh, set this up real quick. Um, oh, there was questions here. <coughs> I think we should have ideally aim to have all FS relevant tests in one location, also known as XFS test. Yes, that is actually um, what we. So I, I, yes, I agree with that, but I think that that's, that's the, the status quo for a lot of folks. Maybe not a lot of file systems actually, file system developers aim for that, but I tend to agree with that. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys, maybe that's an LSFMM type of debate to, to have. So there's on the chat, um, Jeff also mentioned um, he's going to use uh Yeah, I'm going to use Tmake. Um, Tmake's a, a, a fork of Tmux, which allows you to so so instead of trying to follow on the grainy screen, which which you're doing here, um, it allows you oh, to okay. uh, as an alternative. Yeah, you can you can watch it as, instead of doing that. I always have a hard time looking on little screens like this. So uh, give me a sec to pull this up. Sure, sure. All right, there. I'm now I'm sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, um, I put a. Uh, a Pi NFS workflow into KDevOps a while back. So uh, uh, Chuck Lieber, so I, 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 um, Chuck Lieber took over as maintainer of the NFS server a while back, and and I was uh, moving from doing Ceph work, so I uh, volunteered to help him as co-maintainer. Uh, and one of the things we really need badly for NFSD in particular is CI. Uh, we don't have any good way to to uh, track regressions and and find those right now. Uh, we're pretty dependent on distros and stuff that that ship NFSD, um, at, you know, as a you know as a feature to uh, to do that for us. So uh, you know, the goal here is to try to get us something. Uh, I still don't have a good place to run this thing on a periodic basis, but I have the uh, the thing basically working now. Um, so in any case, on, on this box, um, I'm running uh, this box is a uh, just a Fedora machine, and I've been using uh, just the Vagrant based. Uh, uh, K DevOps stuff to, to run tests out of VMs locally on this machine. So it's just Fedora 37. Um, I'm in the K DevOps directory here. And uh, so like, like uh, Luis uh, did, the, the key to all this stuff in K DevOps is to run make menu config. And, and quite frankly, it's a lot like working with the kernel in that uh, you kind of like at least once need to kind of walk through all the options or a lot of them anyway and read all the help text and figure out what they all do. Uh, because it's, there's a lot of little uh, knobs that can be twiddled with this stuff and it can be, and if you don't twiddle them all the correct way, then things don't work the way you like. <laughs> so, um, so in any case, I, I've already run KDevOps on this box. Um, my target arch is x86-64, oops. Um, hang on a sec. And, uh, Okay, I'm not going to mess with some of this stuff. Um, uh, so the bring up methods for the, this, I've, I've uh, so for um, the workflow that I added is the PyNFS workflow. And PyNFS is a test suite for, for NFS servers primarily. Um, and basically what it does is it's just a synthetic client that will open a socket to an NFS server and start issuing commands to it and stuff and, and look at the replies and make sure that they are what it expects. Um, and so, uh, you know, I figured that would be a good place to start with this stuff since it's uh, it's fairly self-contained. We can run it over localhost, uh, and so that's what this does: is is it spins up um, uh, machines under Vagrant 
and uh, sets up NFSD on them, then turns around and runs PyNFS against them, and then looks at compares those results against the baseline set that we've got in the in checked into the tree. Um, so in any case, I've got all this set up for Fedora at the moment, but uh, um, that's not it. Oh, and you can see here, I added, one of the things I had to add to do this was to add NFS server support. So I have some basic options here. You can turn on the NFS server. Um, and now I have a, uh, and I've got this thing set up to configure and run PyNFS. And I only have a single option in PyNFS right now, which is where to get the tree. It needs some, this needs some more fleshing out. It's still pretty primitive. Um, the other thing I haven't done too um, is uh, set up anything to run in parallel, which, which needs to be done. So that's, uh, that's on next on my to-do list actually for the PyNFS stuff. So in any case, um, I've got run through all the config and I've set it up to run PyNFS. So now I go and run make like, like, uh, like you're supposed to. Uh, and that builds all the right config files that, uh, that it requires and wants. Uh, and now I can do a make bring up. Okay, yeah, make bring up. Yeah, and, and in, the, in my case, I'm not using the I'm using the session based uh, libvirt stuff. So uh, the the guests run as my local user on this box instead of running as root, which is actually a little more secure. Um, in fact, you know, moving to KDev or working with KDevOps is what prompted me to change all my uh, local config uh, guests to, to do that instead of using the system one, uh, because I figured it, there's no reason not to do it that way. All right, it's bringing up this machine. I'll take a minute. So the other nice thing about this was that because I can run these tests over localhost, um, I don't have to worry about trying to figure the networking out. Um, one of the things I wanted to, after I you know, finish up the PyNFS workflow is add a workflow for another test suite that we have called the NFS test. Uh, and, but that one requires actual clients and servers. And so I'm you know, still sorting through how, we, uh, how do we set up multiple machines and uh, give them different configs and stuff like that. So, uh, so I'm hoping to do that at some point here soon. All right, it's bringing up the host. This all takes a minute. A lot of times I run make and and, you know, make bring up and and make Linux and then, you know, go do and then walk away and go do something else for a while while the list runs. Sorry, this is slow. It's not a very fast machine, I'm afraid. Well, maybe it's doing something. Hmm. And now I have to go and see what's going on with the. Uh... <laughs> I'm not sure why it's hung at the gathering facts. Well, it was working earlier. Sure what it's doing. The guests are up, so I'm not sure. Uh, here, let's do it again. <clears throat> so anyway, um, yeah, once all this is up and running, it should be able to do a, uh, I should be able to run make PyNFS and bring it in. <clears throat> anyway, it's not terribly exciting to watch any of this stuff. Essentially, after I run all this, I'll run, um, you could, I could run make Linux, first of all, to instead of having it run a uh, distro kernel on the guest, it would bring up, uh, you know, a particular uh, um, kernel, build, build and install a, ker a kernel on the box. Uh, and then I can run make PyNFS and then make PyNFS baseline and then uh, and then I can also run this thing in the loop. Um, you know, the main difference in my uh, setup, um, here I'll do a, uh, just bring up a different shell, um, 
is uh, um, I, I can run, um, let me see. Um, the other thing I can do is uh, I have a, a particular, a, my uh, view of the, um, of the results is a little different. Um, I, so PyNFS can generate a JSON file uh, with the test results in it. And so that's what I have it do. And I have, a, I have some sort of like master, you know, current baseline copies of, the, of those JSON files locally. And then I have a little Python script that goes in and slurps them both in and basically checks to see that the new uh, results that we've run don't have any new failures. Uh, and so if you don't have any new failures, we call it a success and then and move on. Let me see if this thing ever came back up. Ah, that time it worked. Okay. I'm not sure what it was doing. So in any case, I can bring that in. And this just slurps down uh, <clears throat> PyNFS from the upstream Git tree uh, and builds it. Uh, There's not a lot of not a lot of building that has to be done. Um, and it so it puts that on the in the data partition on the on the guest. Uh, and then we will we can run it. I'm not going to sit around and wait for it to run because it takes about an hour to run all the tests in PyNFS. So, uh, but for now, it uh, yeah this kind of gives you an idea of how it works. Um, yeah, my simple Python script oops, sorry, is um, workload is PyNFS. Uh, oh, sorry, I actually be in a different directory. Where did I put that thing? Um, scripts, maybe? Okay, workflows. Yeah, I have a, a script in here, which is uh, check PyNFS results. Py, which is just a pretty simple Python script. It just slurps in both of the JSON files and then looks to see if any of them uh, make sure that there's no new failures. So, um, and if uh, so, if new stuff passes that didn't pass that didn't pass before, it doesn't it doesn't fail that or anything because of that or send any messages or anything. You have to just kind of check that on your own. But the, but the uh, but it will at least tell you if there's you know new failures in the set. So I've got some improvements I need to do. Um, one of the things I want to do is uh, set it up so that it runs the 4.1 and 4.0 tests. Because basically, that's um, there are two sets of tests in PyNFS. There's NFS 4.0 and everything, and then all the 4.1 plus, which are all the later ones. Uh, and so I, I would like to be able to run those in parallel at the same time. And there's no reason we can't. I just haven't set up all the code to do that. And I've got to figure out how to make Ansible uh, spawn background processes and stuff and wait for them. So anyway, that's about all I got. Um, anyway, any questions? Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Luis. Sure. So I'd like to uh, review one more thing, too. And before asking Adam, um, if, if you're ready, I'll, I'll ask you to talk in a second about CXL. Um, but I'll, I forgot to mention a few important things as I was seeing Jeff's uh, demo. One of the things that's important too is um, the <clears throat> the directories used for Linux. So I'm in the directory where I git clones. So I can do git log. And uh, if I do CD Linux, I'll see that this is actually a, a bare clone of Linux next. What this means too, is that I can go ahead and, and modify any, this is actually the Linux kernel, right? So I can go ahead and modify things here SSH into any of the guests here. And then on those guests, if I wanted to, for instance, that should be in data Linux next. So this is actually a mount for 9P. So it's read only access. But if I want to, I can compile this on, on the host. Uh, and then let's say, trigger a build. So once this is eventually done, this is obviously doing this manually. Obviously I can just run make Linux and it'll do the same thing. You can also specify a delimiter for hosts. So like let's say make Linux and then hosts and then put the, in, in 
hear the, the I must upgrade your list of posts that you want it to install. Or you can just do this manually, just like I was sh trying to show you guys a little while ago. If I had compiled, I can run just sudo make modules install, install, and this should do the right thing. Um, it's the same exact thing. Just that um, with KDOPS, it'll also use some heuristics to try to ensure that the kernel that you are compiling will be the one that Grub selects. The other thing too, um, see, oh, uh, the other thing I wanted to show is make dine config. So make dine config is an example of um, of allowing you to have a dean options that require that dynamic reading of your host system to allow them to be specified in kconfig. What is an example of this? One of them is, is how to enable PCI passing onto guests. So if you if you want to do that, you want to run make dynconfig. And now uh, you should be able to see the PCI pass through support option. Otherwise it's not available. This lets you specify if you want to, you know, how you want to pass through the device onto you know, one guest only, uh, you will specify the, the, the host name that, you know, manually, or you want to specifically target, you know, a host per each PCIe device that you have on the system. So that's the more complex one. So let's select that option. What this did is the dynamic aspect. This, so this is dynamic kconfig. This is not part of, you know, you don't have a static kconfig file for this because it can't. You need to parse your PCI list table and generate kconfig data for the specific system. So what this is doing is uh, doing that and it specifies specifying also the IOM new group. Why is that specified? Because typically you would need to pass through all the devices part of an IOM new group to do a successful uh, PCI pass through. So in this case, for instance, I can do pass through for my you know desktop system, for instance, onto a guest. So if I wanted to, I can select that, and here I can specify the name of the guest. So that's the more complex option. The simple one would be, no, I want to pass through to all my devices that I specify to this one guest. Uh, I'm not going to do that right now because I hadn't actually prepared for that. I forgot to actually prepare for that demo. But, you know, if there are bugs, let me know. Um, thanks to Joseph, who had actually originally implemented the initial PCI pass through. I just added the, the dynamic key config stuff. Um, Adam, are you online? Yep, I'm online. All right, cool. I'll pass on the torch to you if, if it's okay about uh, a little generic stuff about CXL. Oh yeah, of course. And I can show show a little bit of what's going uh, uh, support that we currently have too. So hold on, let me share the screen too. Sure. Uh, okay. And if folks have questions, please think about them. So I want to. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So, so like like everyone's saying, so what we use kconfig, right? So it's a, a make menu config. And before I start showing things, uh, let me give a high level overview, right? So um, one of the things that our team is working on is uh, upstream CXL development, and this includes the QMU side as well as on the kernel side. And things are changing pretty fast. So I would just warn anyone starting to to, to look in this area, things break pretty often and uh, there's always a dependency of features of moving with uh, QMU and the, the kernel and typically QMU is not moving as fast as the kernel like so things will be posted for QMU but they're typically not put into master uh, as, as quickly as things are moving on the kernel side so that's just the FYI and I don't know if uh, Luis mentioned but there is a, um, a discord uh, server that we use to talk about KDevOps and so I regularly look there and there's a channel specifically for CXL as well. And, uh, you know, uh, people are available that are using KDevOps. So I would just recommend that people um, actually uh, uh, connect to that uh, Discord server and then ask questions there. And so, yeah, we can kind of guide you through through how to use some of these features. But um, so, you know, thanks to Luis, you know, he, he puts um, basic support for CXL. And I've just been slowly kind of updating and trying to stabilize it a little bit. 
And so uh, I'll sort of go through the, the main things that you want to do. And so one of the first things here is that uh, typically you're going to use a custom version of QMU. And so, so here you have one of the options is to specify like which uh, Git tree to clone, um, where you want to place it, uh, as well as the branch, the branch to use. And for example, uh, Jonathan Cameron is uh, someone working at Huawei and he does a lot of uh, QMU development. And so uh, we added his um, uh, repo, his, his uh, QMU repo as one of the defaults that you can use uh, just because he does a lot of the active development. And then uh, I'm just working with a certain version that has uh, CXL support. And uh, one thing that, that we've done recently too is that we've been, um, uh, we, we, well, and so I, things might be broken. I just got a message about that, but uh, I'm trying to just build the archi the architecture, architecture specified by KDevOps, that same version of QMU. And so, um, uh, but cause right now we're just building all, all the uh, architectures for QMU. So, uh, yeah, those are a couple of options to, to set. And so the last thing that I'll do, oh, I'll show a couple of things. So we have basic topologies set right now. So one thing with QMU is that it, it de depends on um, having a PCIe based top topology like that that's enabled. So um, the, the root port has to be CXL enabled, and then you have to specify devices underneath uh, the um, root port. And there's something called the fixed memory window, uh, which uh, exposes some amount of uh, memory to the system where the CXL devices can live. But uh, with KDevOps, we simplify a lot of that. And then you can kind of just talk about a high level uh, topology of what you want in your CXL. And so like the, for example, we have uh, like just a basic topology with the type three device. And then uh, that's just a single root port. And there were issues on the kernel side with this basic configuration and that, that were exposed for some of this testing. And then the other simple one is just a host bridge with two root ports. And these are very basic topologies, but uh, I would just caution you that, that uh, things are moving so fast on the QMU side and the kernel side, uh, these things often break, even these simple cases. And the hope is that uh, once things stabilize, we'll get things that look a little closer to what some systems uh, will look like. And then hopefully we can kind of build some tests on top of it. But we're just leveraging KDevOps to provide the virtual machine and provide the kernel uh, that we're going to use for development right now. Okay, so let me go back here. And then one other thing that we uh, need to set is that there's this notion of the workflows in KDevOps, and they're just... Um, specific uh, workflows that you use uh, with your virtual machines. And there's a CXL one. And what it currently does is build uh, NDCTL and you can set the, the version that you want. And the, the reason it does that is so it's a, it has a, a new tool called the CXL tool that lists like CXL devices. And uh, I think everything built for me. So I'll, I'll go ahead and show it uh, what it does. So let me back out of here. And over here, so you'll see, I did a make, a make CXL, uh, make Linux so that I have a newer version. So let me just SSH into this machine. All right, and then we'll sh see that we have uh, a newer kernel. I think this was next uh, 2023, 224. And then, so I should be able to do a CXL list dash. And then, oh, let me pipe to less. And then you'll see that you actually have a, a valid uh, CXL topology, and then you can uh, like convert this into um, current, uh, use like the KMEM dev DAX driver. There's different options you can do, but a lot of these things, uh, I look at it uh, one day and then two days later it's broken and versions change. So I would just say this is very uh, moving very fast, but I would encourage anyone interested in CXL uh, to kind of uh, jump on KDevOps and contribute that way so we can all have baselines that we can share. And so from, I think uh, that's about it. So if anyone has specific questions about CXL uh, support and KDevOps, I'm slowly working on it. And so, uh, yeah, just reach out uh, or ask here. So uh, that's all I got, Luis. Great. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> and so I'd just like to open it up for a question now and just uh, any anything that folks want to see. Any rants, you know, anything that folks want to talk about in particular? Hey, Amir. I was muted. Hi. 
Sorry, I got the hours mixed up a bit. No worries, no worries. I, I try to I try to see if I can sneak into your your stable stuff so that way I can demo that since I know you didn't have time for that. But I try to attach to your team like session. But I was like, I'm, I'm not. I don't want to ruin his workflow. So um, no, <laughs> nothing. There's nothing running now. You can do it. No, well, you know. Uh, Let's see, can I, can I attach and then you, you drive? Because I'm not sure what you have there. But, you know, if folks have questions, yeah. so would, please feel free. You can do it, but but honestly, there's not much to show. I mean, everything is so... Uh, well, remember, this is... This yeah, is the I mean, you so. fire the test and... Uh, I don't know, because I missed uh, the first hour there. of the talk, you, I you, guess. You, you, if you SSH you, and, and you attach to your team session, you can take, take, take over. Yeah, I'll do that, but... Uh, did you show, did you show them uh, running a loop? No, no, I didn't because I, I haven't ran a loop in a while. But uh, while, right, let while me do if, that. Amir has time for that, you know, I, I like to open up for questions still too. Any anyone? Questions? Yeah, sure, do that. I'll, I'll connect. So just to give you guys some context here, Mir, Mir has volunteered to help with uh, some of the XFS stable backboarding. Uh, that's very, very thankless type of work. You know, uh, I've done it before and it's a pain in the ass. Uh, Chandan has also done this. We have someone else from, uh, from Google who has done some of that work too. Um, it's, it's a pain in the ass because you, it requires a high level of detail for review of those patches and also a lot of testing, right? Um, so, um, he uses it for some of the, the, the uh, testing for 5.10 for XFS. Um, and, um, and yeah, so questions, folks. What do folks think? You know, come give feedback. I think it's um, really useful, but I think I need to play with this myself in order to get a better understanding of uh, how it would fit into my workflow because right now I'm just, you know, manually running XFS tests for various file systems whenever I change something. Um, but I see that K DevOps could be really useful there for sure. Okay. It, it has a lot of left edges still, uh, but it's uh, but it's still it's pretty useful. Um, so uh, you know I, I, it take me a while, took me a while to get to ramp up my learning curve enough to to where I could actually use it. But now now I think I'm a Getting closer to being able to use it pretty effectively. <laughs> Jeff, what do you what do you think might help to 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 lower that that ramp up threshold? Um, it took me a little a long time to just kind of wrap my brain around the concepts of the way that K DevOps is built, right? Because uh, a lot of it's pretty abstract, um, and so it just it was just very you know difficult for me to sort of like sort through oh you know, what should I be aiming for to you know, for this to do. Um, so what, what might be actually good is, is not so much demos, but like maybe even like a write up with a concrete example of how you use this to, to test a test of maybe a kernel patch, right? Uh, that would be a kind of a nice thing to have. Um, you no, know, you could do one for F, you know for FS tests pretty easily, I think. I, I think that would kind of help c cement in my mind. Okay, this is how this thing sort of works, and then then at that point I could go back and say, okay, well now now I. Now I know what I want to aim for when I want to do my testing, right? So makes sense. So, so a bit more uh, on the documentation side for actual concrete cases to test a regression, for instance. Yeah, I mean, even just like a, um, you know, like a, the demo, like you were doing just now, is fine. But you know, it, it would be nice to have sort of like a case study, right? You know, where you had, I I have this patch. Now I need to go test it, right? What do I do, right? You know. You know, push it to my branch, and I point K DevOps to it here. You know, I do you know do all the little steps that you would do to you know, from maybe a bare bones K DevOps install even right you know to to get things going, and, and all the way to testing the patch, right? Sure. sure. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, we can work on that for sure. Hey, Mary, do you want to share your screen or? Anything? Yeah, um, I'm not connected through my uh, computer, but I can I can either. Connect again from my uh, PC, or if you want to share your screen with my Tmux, that's also possible. Let me just. Check. I can, but I'm, I'm not sure if Tmux will follow. But yeah, I, I can do that. Let me let me do that. Let me let me try to connect from 
the workstation that works. In the meantime, any other questions? I'm afraid I didn't install Zoom on my workstation. So can you try to share uh, your screen yeah. with the team? Um, I am, yeah. I'm in the team session that says I am here. Can folks see? Yeah, I see you. Yeah, sure. Do you hear me okay? With this, yeah, you're uh, fine. Okay. Can, can folks see the right. I am here comment? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So I don't know exactly what, what to show. I mean, uh, I, you did show the basic steps, right? About on bring up. And yeah, yeah. So and basically, the, we covered already how to bring up Linux, you know, so forth. I, I guess what would be useful is like, what do you typically do to try to, you know, kind of like how Jeff was, was indicating to test against a regression, you know? Okay, let's uh, I'll try. First of all, so, so this is like um, uh, an instance of KDevops that I set up for the 5.10 uh, VMs that I have. Um, I know, did you show them the list of VMs, et cetera? Yes, yes, um, I already did the, the list. All right, so I have a few, the, the VMs on the top are the 5.10 5 XFS VMs. And let's see, I usually have some, uh, a few Tmux uh, windows like that. And then uh, there's the, um, did you show them the monitor, the watchdog monitor? Yeah, the watchdog, yes. And what this is doing here, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the output of that file is, but the watchdog essentially checks to see if you have anything stalled. So I take, I take it that this is grepping out, you know, the, the prefix or something? This is just the, 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 status, the status file. It's a watch. Oh, on the you know, I, I just can't see it because maybe, maybe I have to do a control L or something like that. Um, uh, let me just, it's just, uh, I'm just doing a watch on the, oh, there you go. on the status, so, on the status file and, and the, the dot kernel CA okay is a counter for the number of times that the loop has completed and the status file, uh, always, uh, uh goes on and, uh, queries all the, all the VMs for the test that they are running currently and it's current on time. So what you're seeing now is just the, the last snapshot, the last uh, query where all the tests were done on the VMs and the last VM was running the last uh, test. I mean, we can start it over and see how it progresses, but I don't think that's really uh, uh, what's missing here. Uh, also, it, it queries the, the uname of the kernel to see that you're sane. And that sometimes you can see the things are not saying when the VM boots into a different kernel. So that's nice. You can see a nice progress of everything. And whenever there is an issue, I mean, when, when this is currently set up to run 10 loops and then stop. So this is what happened here. So to uh, get some, it's via the con yeah. To, to give some context to folks, uh, the kernel CI targets running what essentially it does is it it runs that watchdog script python watchdog script that i demoed let's earlier. start it let's start it yeah and, and then it uh, it always every like so for so many seconds it basically updates the current dot kernel ci status file with the output and it does this that way if you want to have a like a website that actually has something that displays the status you can do that um <clears throat> okay so you're running the loop um that's yeah, essentially it takes a few it takes a few moments for the status to get updated for the first time it reboots the VMs and uh 
you're saying you you don't see the screen when I run watch? Uh, watch. Uh, it seemed the output was a bit different than 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 than, than when you're caddying right now when you're doing the head. Okay, it doesn't matter. We wait. We'll do a manual watch. No, you, you can go ahead and do it. Do the do the head. That's fine. Yeah. Oh I yeah, don't I, I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't display anything actually here. Yeah. It doesn't matter, but the thing is, uh, when you run the loop, uh, if anything goes wrong, at the end of the loop, of course, we run all the tests and, and then it queries the, all the results, um, all the bad results from the VM, actually the full results, I think. And then if anything went wrong, it will stop the loop. And then you can see me highlighting, right? Oh uh, no! No, no, no. That no, that's not possible. Of course, uh, you can see my my cursor, maybe. Yes. Yes. Uh, so where am I? There? I lost. Oh yeah, here it is. You can see my cursor. So yes. What happened is, uh, well, it's not. I don't have an example here. Uh, but but it looks something like this. I mean, when the test stops, you just do a git d for git status, and you see uh, the the arrows are are inserted like this into the expunge file, and lets you decide whether you want to commit the failed test into an expunge file, or of course investigate it and do something else about it. So this is just an example of a, of a test that failed, uh, generic 604. And I went ahead and, uh, and examined the output, the full output, and I saw that it looks like a test bug. So at this point, I didn't bother go uh, fix the test. I just expunged it so I can continue running the loop. It's not perfect, but that's the, but that's the workflow. When, whenever I have more time, I try to invest more in fixing tests. Um, and what else uh, can you see? So I guess the, the status must be ready right now. Yeah, so now you see that this test uh, started to run and the VMs are showing the progress, which tests are running at the moment. And there's also there are also several configuration in the config file about uh, timeouts, like a maximum timeout uh, or 10, 10 times, I don't know, 100 times uh, longer than the last runtime. There are several configuration options that can end up with the monitor with the watchdog stopping the loop for a, a hang test. That's also uh, something that can happen. And what else? What else can we see? Um, in the end, let's see if there's something here in this cutter. Yeah, there's. I, can I, can I, so, uh, regarding Jeff's question, it's actually a very tricky thing. I mean, if you have a patch, you want to test it. It's kind of not straightforward uh, with how KDevOps is is built right now because uh, it's gotten a little better with uh, with the way that uh, the building the the kernel on the host because otherwise uh, all the guests pull all their knowledge and and templates from GitHub of KDevops. KDevops. So they used to pull all the config files to build the kernel from uh, uh, upstream. And right now I wanted to test uh, a few patches. So I prepared a, a new tag or branch and I just, uh, I pushed it to my GitHub. I, ha I have my uh, setup pulling uh, the Linux tree from my GitHub. And then, um, did you show them the uh, build option on the host? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So so I just have the tag pulled here. 
this is just backports to 5.10 from 5.11, just a few backports. And then the thing is with KDevops, you have to have this, uh, uh, you can see it here, the, the config file, but it's, it's just a symbolic link, right? I didn't change the config, but you need to have a config file with the name of the tag or branch that you're building um, to serve as the config file to build the kernel. So I just have it locally here and it's convenient. Uh, but you also need to have also need to have uh, where is it? Um, the expansion fi expansion files are also specific to a, a specific version that you are testing. So it's kind of odd that you, whenever I progress uh, uh, the base kernel to 5.10, dot one seven six I have to add to add those uh, symbolic links for the config files and for the uh, symbolic links for the for the expanse files because this is how this directory of expanse files uh, looks it just has many symbolic links for every uh, version that I ever that I've tested. So I can't say it's very convenient for a workload of testing a single patch or maybe there is a better way that I couldn't figure out it myself. I don't know Luis if you have another idea but I just I just add um, the new version whenever I need to test it. Yeah I mean I, I, um, I think that, that that's that's a good gen <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, generic strategy for all the guests. Typically, what 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 I what I ended up doing was um, if I saw an issue with specific uh, section only, I would try to fix that specifically on the guest itself um, by compiling on the host and then running manually, make install on on the guest, and then fixing it. You know, and then once I verify on the guest itself manually. Like kind of running a, a, the test in the loop or something like that manually, like five times. Uh, I know that FS, FS test now has an option to run the test for X amount of time. Um, once I'm, I'm confident that it is fixed for that section, I would hope that it is fixed for the other ones as well, or there's no regressions, and then I run a full new new set of tests. So that's typically what I what I used to do. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that I think the, um, the way we work now with these, all, all the developers that are somehow involved with KDevOps sort of have push privileges. So just every one of us pushes his own uh, symbolic links here and expunges and config fi files. And uh, there's a limit to how much that can scale as the community grows. So I don't have an answer here. I'm just saying it works for me. I mean, I got the push privileges. We got the Discord server. Um, we're a small group, small community for now. It sort of works, but I don't really see how the same, it, how it can scale uh, the exact same model. You know, um, I mean, <clears throat> that that's that, that is, it's interesting to see if it doesn't scale. I'm, I'm, I'd be very curious, but at least, um, do you mean in terms of like running into conflicts or, or, or what? Oh, I don't know, just, uh, I don't know. I never, uh, I never tried to work in a situation where a large group of people have push privileges, but uh, with no maintainer no single maintainer or a group of maintainers. So that's what I'm referring to. And well, so maybe we can, we can show, maybe we can show the fact that there's uh, the results. I mean, 
and uh, the scripts pull the results uh, from the server, from the VM. So I can never remember where the results are, but I think there's a new path right now, right? The last re uh, result, if I'm remembering correctly. Last run, right? No, I don't know. Um, kind of confused. I think it's uh, also the leftovers from different uh, layovers of results, but uh, just we can see here from the last run, uh, you have a summary of the results, uh, X unit uh, uh, format, where all the tests pass. And we have for every for every VM, we also have uh, the detailed results in case there was something we needed to look at. We can look at the detailed results and see everything, including the message and uh, and if there are bad uh, out bad files and. Uh, what does it pull? It pulls out bad files and the message files. And yes. if, the, if there was a failure, and it also gets them to the to the host to the same directory. And I think there's some new uh, methodology of uh, uh, archiving results because I see that uh, Chandan here left an archived uh, result and committed it. Yes. Uh, where was it? So I, I didn't do that. I didn't get a chance to do that yet. Uh, but uh, there's a tarball here with results from running uh, fiber for. Right? That's about it. I mean, the best thing so about it is. It's uh, just file and forget. I mean, it's true what Jeff said. There's a there's kind of a long learning curve at the beginning, and also since I don't do that like every other week, sometimes it's uh, months pass before I get back to testing another batch. Then every time I come I come back and I do git pull on the kdevops. Uh, it's a pretty f fast moving project with a lot of improvements, but that means there's occasional break uh, breakups of uh, things. But, but in the end, uh, when you get to, uh, to the state where you just fire the loop and uh, wait for uh, the results, it's just uh, perfect. Cool. Thank, thanks, uh, Mir. Really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Jeff, you were pointing out how, you know, it's pain in the ass to always have to do the update for the config. Yeah, I think um, there should be a way for us to resolve that. That, that would res resolve. I mean, I think it would help Amir, too, given that he's always revving the kernel to the latest stable kernel, too. Uh, so may maybe maybe a specific, you know, generic name for the branch um, to, to, to indicate that this is the one that you, you should use for the latest kernel, regardless of what it is that you're using. Um, because otherwise we would end up likely using some random config for an older kernel. But if we had one per, per branch, given that we will also have to commit something per branch. So for example, I, I just added <clears throat> a new branch <clears throat> for testing large block stuff. Um, and that one uh, required me to have a sim link to Linux next. So I added a sim link for my branch, but <clears throat> if I update my branch now, <clears throat> it'll I, I also will need to essentially look for uh, a new sim link or add a new sim link to latest Linux next as well. If we had <clears throat> a specific file uh, that that was generic, kind of like latest, to always ensure that it points, then I think that might work. Yeah, I I think uh, you know having something where. You know, when, when you don't have one that matches your specific branch name, then you pull this one in, right? I don't, I don't know exactly how we'd have to implement that, but, but that would be handy. Cool. 
Um, any questions from folks? Comments, feedback? Um, you know, more like a, a just a generic question. You know, um, one of the things I need is a place to run uh, this stuff on a regular basis, right? And uh, you know, I would love to do this in the cloud rather than having to do it on the box, you know, the space heater under my desk, right? So I would. Um, is that I've seen like places. I know Microsoft has a program for, um, you know, for cloud credit, free cloud credits that you can get. Um, for Azure, right? And, uh, but you have to have like, you know, a chartered project with a code of conduct and all that stuff. Do we have that for the Linux kernel? I mean, is it, does anyone so, know? If we... I, I have checked, um, but essentially, fortunately, Samsung does uh, help with this and, and I'm, I'm using essentially the system that I was provided to me to help with kernel development. I'm sharing it with the community and for specific developers that do want to help with this sort of testing, you can essentially get an account. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch base with you on Discord and I can give you an account if that helps. It's a pretty beefy system. The, the stuff that we've been demoing here are in that uh, server. It's a, it's a, it's, it is pretty beefy. Um, so let's see, it's a 48 cores. Um, Quite a bit of memory well, let, and most importantly. Well, let's see how busy it is. Let's see how busy it is right now with only with only seven uh, VMs running because I just wanted to show you that these seven uh, VMs, they eat up like one and a half terabyte of data from, from this. I mean, it's not very uh, optimized. Yes, There's, you, you, there's you, not a lot of sharing to do here. Yes, you're right. I mean, one of the issues has been the amount of, of RAM. Uh, but <clears throat> then again, you know, one of the things that we've learned before Amir too was <clears throat> there's sometimes a lot of guests that are <clears throat> left running that, you know, people are not using. So the last cleanup I did trimmed, trimmed them down considerably. So we should essentially just do this pretty often, check to see what's not actually running and just kill them, right? Only really, and, and then coordinate, we can just coordinate on, on Discord, right? <clears throat> If folks are not yeah. really using something, let's just kill them. And we should be monitoring our memory to see how much we're using. But if we do that, um, I mean, so far it's just mostly you, myself on this server. Um, sometimes I run the Butterfest stuff. Sometimes I run random tests, but um, I think we can scale. And if needed, maybe maybe if we can then bring this up at LSFMM. But right now we have the server. So Jeff, you know, if you'd like, you know, it can coordinate with you, get you access if you're interested in running on the server, and then you can, you know, use some of the resources there. Other than that, yeah, it'd be great to also run um, things on the cloud too, but, you know, we can talk to, to folks later or at LSFMM. Yeah, that's kind of, I think I'd rather do something in the cloud because, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I kind of, I could get, you know, CPU time that, uh, you know, on the machines at Red Hat too, uh, but I'd rather have something that's kind of like divorced from my job for this this bit right you know so yeah. I, I, I think i would like something that's portable and that we can move easily if we need to you know who knows right you know? yes yes i i understand where you're going with that and that's exactly actually one of the reasons why i i like the workflow behind the idea of being agnostic to the cloud and virtualization solution is that when it is that you need to pick up and move on to a specific new type of environment you can just do that ramp up pretty fast um, having the options to do that is really nice. Um, I, I obviously can't promise anything about commitment for this to last and so forth, but at least so far it's been about a year now and we've been using this resource. So I'm just saying if it's, it's available and if it would help you in the meantime, then great. Other, other than that, there's obviously distributed stuff that we can think about, you know, um, I don't know, you know, like I have some personal servers, maybe we can, you know, group them up or something like that. Um, it's, it's, it's really a weird way to think about a cloud, right? It's like a distributed cloud solution rather than an open stack solution. I'm not sure if such concepts really exist, but that sort of thing, maybe we can just dedicate, you know, compute resources to, to instances. I'm not sure how the, that would work. It'd be uh, weird. Way I, I feel like the cloud provider is at OS. 
<laughs> What's that? You know, I feel like the cloud providers kind of owe us. You know, they ought to be able to give us some CPU time for this. Well, you know, I mean, you know what, we're considering that they should able to use our work. So I, I would like to see them pony up and give us some CPU time for this sort of thing. Personally. Well, so um, I know Ted always said that essentially they do have resources, but if you're testing it uh, for EXT, EXT stuff, right? Um, but, you know, that's not my focus, right? I want to test on any random stuff. So I think this is a generic topic that keeps recurring at LSFMM. Um, so maybe that's another place where we can discuss some of these things. Ideally, I'd also, it'd be really nice, I think, too, to be able to have, let's say, a patch or series of branches and then be able to, let's say, give it to someone and say, hey, please make sure that this doesn't cause a regression. It'd be nice if we had that available, too. I mean, it's also a simple opportunity for folks who are doing contracting work to get experience with this, be able to do that and, and build confidence and provide, you know, zero regression testing. Um, but right now we don't have it and it's a lot of work. So in that chart that I showed earlier, that gives a lot of possibilities here for, for, for folks to, to help also. Uh, the community can obviously help too, but uh, I think we need to educate folks to help, how to help, right? Because if, if it's all about, about running a baseline, folks can do that in home systems. There's a lot of people in the community who have systems that they can probably dedicate to running a baseline and building confidence, right? Running a test a thousand times or whatever. Why not? If you already have a baseline, it shouldn't be an issue, right? The problem is really getting to the point you have a baseline and then getting a report of the issue. Well, specifically for our use case, I mean, what I'm interested in is being able to take, like, uh, like when we take in a, uh, patches from, from mailing list, right, you know, or, you know, file patches from wherever, uh, and then say, okay, I want to run, you know, a bunch of tests against this set and make sure nothing regressed, right? Um, and so I need to be able to kind of do that on demand. I, I feel like, you know, so, I, you know, having, it's great to have some the, something that we could point community people at and say, hey, can you, run, you know, run this when, when they need to test you know, some specific configuration or something. But, well, uh, so but, I, for, but longer term, I need something that's, uh, you know, that's going to be, you know, like an actual CI. Yeah, yeah. So, well, one of the things that I, I, I have been, leaving uh, at the end of my, my queue is to talk with the zero day folks. And the goal there would be to essentially uh, have them use KDOPS to, as an option to test something, for, in for instance, on, on a branch that I have on kernel.org or something like that, right? Then we already know the target workflows. You, need, you know the target branch, right? You can deduce that. Um, and it, they just need to, the information about what commands to run. And they already have the infrastructure for that. They, they, they have claimed that they have infinite resources for that sort of thing. Um, they just need to know what to run. But that dialogue still hasn't started yet because I was trying to fit, wrap up with the self-test for, for, for some of the subsystems that I maintain. Um, and that timeout thing is the one thing that's, that's blocking right now. Once that thing's out of the way, then I'll talk to them and then I'll have them run self-tests for my branches for KMOD, CCTL, for instance, uh, firmware API. Then the next step would be on the file system side of things. Zero day does run some file system testings, but it doesn't do it for all the branches and they only run a few tests. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that testing file system is really complex and it's very subjective. But if you already have community blessed con configurations, um, and you already have a workflow that you know can try to root cause uh, at least some of the low, the really difficult issues, then perhaps this is one way to go, right? Now, obviously, they, they, they won't be using cloud. They'll be using local virtualization, but that's fine. I mean, this is what's being used for some of the testing for, for stable, for instance, for XFS, and it's proven to, to help find issues. Uh, so, I mean, if folks would like to also have that conversation uh, with zero day folks, I'd, I'd be happy to CC folks when, when that does happen. But I think that, that would be another option too, because then, then you just get pushed into your kernel.org, for instance, and then you just ask for specific tests to be run. Ideally, we would have all, you know, a whole bunch of cloud providers and so forth to be able to run these tests as well too. I mean, given that KDO is already supports these things in a cloud agnostic manner, that should be possible. That dialogue, however, is not yet there, right? So, I mean, these are just tools that are available to enable us to get to that point.
but yeah, I mean, the overall K DevOps seems to be a you know, the promising way to go. I, I really like that it's agnostic. You can run the same thing on your local machine and theoretically in cl in the cloud too or wherever. Like you know, I think that's pretty important for us to you know as a as a community to be able to have that portability. Cool, cool. Well, uh, thank you, folks. If folks have no questions, I'll just close up and I'll stop um, uh, the recording. All right, well, thank you everyone. No, no, any questions, no, last, last chance. All right, well, thank you everyone. All right, thanks, thanks Luis. See you. Bye.